Thank you, guys. It was great. I don't know what it is, but every time I fill in for Pastor Keith on Tuesday nights, the air conditioner goes out. So I'll tell him to find somebody else, do you guys a favor. Okay. Yeah, yeah it's good. All right. Um, we're going to continue in uh, Second Peter. And uh, tonight, we're, we're going to, the message is really about the assurance that we have, the truth of God's word. And so uh, I'm going to, Pastor Keith covered these scriptures last week. I'm just going to read through them because tonight's scriptures just continue on. So we're going to start in, uh, let's open in prayer. Father God, uh, thank you f- for the truth of your word. It gives us a light to our feet. And Father, I uh, just ask that uh, the Holy Spirit would open it up to us tonight, that we could go away with more assurance of your word. Uh, get me out of the way, Father, and uh, thank you for keeping us humble. I ask that in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, from last week, I'm going to start in verse 2. It says, Grace and peace be multiplied to you in the knowledge of God and of Jesus our Lord, as his divine power has given to us all things that pertain to life and godliness. Through the knowledge of him, through the knowledge of him who called us by glory and virtue, by which have been given to us exceedingly great and precious promises, that through these you may be partakers of the divine nature, having escaped the corruption that is in the world through lust. But also for this very reason, giving all diligence, add to your faith virtue, to virtue knowledge, to knowledge self-control, to self-control perseverance, to perseverance godliness to godliness, brotherly kindness, and to brotherly kindness, love. And Pastor Keith covered all those last week. If you add these things, for if these things are yours and abound, you will be neither barren nor unfruitful in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. For he who lacks these things is short-sighted, even to blindness, and has forgotten that he was cleansed from his old sins. Therefore, brethren, because of all these things, be even more diligent to make your call and election sure. For if you do these things, you will never stumble. For so an entrance will be supplied to you abundantly into the everlasting kingdom of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Right there is a confirmation. Jesus is God, Lord and Savior. All right, we're going to start tonight in 2 Peter, verse 12. Because of all that that I just read, he says, For this reason, I, Peter, will not be negligent to remind you always of these things, though you know and you're actually established in the present truth. So Peter says, tells, tells us, I want you to make your calling and election sure. And the reason is so you'll have an entrance into the everlasting kingdom of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Peter says, I know that you know these things, but I'm going to keep reminding you. You know, when we we look at our sports teams, like professional football teams, these players that that play in the uh, NFL, they've been playing football since they were kids. They go up through high school and they go through college. And then when they're, they, they've been doing it their whole life, they know the game. They know the game backwards and forwards. And yet, what do the coaches do? They keep telling them and they make them practice the fundamentals, blocking, tackling. They rehearse plays over and over again. And we're the same way. You know, as Christians, we should never think that we are... Um, above, or that we are so, so mature in our Christian faith that we're above the fundamentals, hearing the fundamentals of our faith over and over again. We should rejoice 
and thank God for our salvation every time we hear the gospel preached. And I know I'm guilty of that sometimes too. I'll confess that. You know, I say, oh, here's the gospel again. And that's my bad. You know, I, I, uh, I should rejoice in my salvation every time I hear that gospel. And not only that, but also, you know, even though we have heard the gospel maybe a thousand times, there may be someone present who's never heard the gospel before or really has heard it but has never understood it, has never had it explained to him. So we never get tired of the fundamentals of our Christian faith. Paul tells us in Romans, For I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it's the power of God to salvation. For everyone who believes, for the Jew first and also for the Greek. So Paul goes on in verse 13, and he continues and he says, Yes, I think it is right, as long as I'm in this tent, as long as I'm in this body, as long as I'm alive, to stir you up by reminding you of this great salvation that we have. Knowing that shortly I must put off my tent, just as our Lord Jesus Christ showed me. So Paul says, as long as I'm alive, I'm sorry, not Paul, Peter, as long as, as, long as I'm alive, Peter says, I'm going to keep reminding you of this great salvation that we have. And how did, what did Jesus show him? Well, we go to John chapter 21, verse 17 and 19. Jesus said to him, Peter, the third time, Simon, son of Jonah, do you love me? Peter was grieved because he said to him the third time, do you love me? And Peter said to him, Jesus, Lord, you know all things. You know that I love you. Jesus said to him, feed my sheep. Feed them my word. Teach them. Most assuredly, I say to you, Peter, when you were younger, you girded yourself and walked where you wished. But when you are old, you will stretch out your hands and another will gird you and carry you where you do not wish. This he, Jesus, spoke, signifying by what death Peter would glorify God. And not long after this letter, Peter was killed. He was martyred for his faith. He was killed under, by the orders of the emperor Nero. He was crucified. Church tradition, and I'm sure you've heard this, is that Peter asked to be crucified upside down because he felt he was not worthy of the same crucifixion as his Lord. His request was granted. So we, it's not in Scripture. We don't know. That's just the tradition that's been handed down to us. Sounds good to me. Moving on, verse 15, Peter says, Moreover, I will be careful to ensure that you always have a reminder of these things after my decease, after I'm dead. So he wrote this letter. And all these years later, here we are tonight, Peter's still reminding us, as God has preserved his word down through the ages, the, his word that the Holy Spirit inspired for our benefit. Verse 16, Peter says, and he's very adamant about this, for we, the apostles, the writers of the New Testament, did not follow cunningly devised fables when we made known to you the power and coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, but were eyewitnesses of his majesty. Now, we have to think, it's, you know, we, it's hard for us in this day and age and in our culture where we have the TV, computer, news is right at our fingertips. But you think back to that time, to, to uh, Jesus' time when Peter's talking about, there was no TV. You know, nobody came on and said, you know, the breaking news. Jesus heals a leper. We have a reporter in Jus Jerusalem. There'll be film at 11. The only way this was spread was by the word of mouth. People telling other people the gospel. People telling other people what Jesus had done. And you have to realize that at this time, 
the ancient world was just filled with tales of gods, small g, controlling all matter of, manner of things, performing all sorts of feats. Peter's saying, look, myself, the other writers, we are eyewitnesses. We want to be clear, Jesus was no mythical fable. We're, we are eyewitnesses. We saw Jesus walk on water. We saw Jesus calm storm. We saw Jesus feed the 5,000. We saw Jesus heal the sick, heal the lame, restore sight to the blind. We saw Jesus cast out demons. We saw Jesus raise Lazarus from the dead. We saw and touched and ate with Jesus after he was resurrected from the dead. We saw him on that cross. We know he died. We saw him die. But we saw him as a resurrected Jesus. He says, and he wants to emphasize, we didn't follow cunningly devised fables. You know, I'll just give you a few that are circulating at that time. And if you've ever studied Greek mythology or Roman mythology, you know, the world was that, at that time had temples to Athena and Diana, different, different uh, places. When Paul went to uh, Athens, there were statues and, and all over the place to various gods. But Osiris, for example, who was the Egyptian god of the afterlife, so-called god of the afterlife. According to the myth, his brother Set, S-E-T, killed him and cut up his body. But his wife gathered up all the parts, wrapped him together as a mummy, and Osiris returned to life. Another one is Zeus. Zeus was king of the Greek gods. He mated with earth women disguised as a swan, disguised as a satyr, S-A-T-Y-R, which is a half man like half goat person, and also as a bull. These offsprings were considered demigods, and great stories and things were told about them, Hercules and different ones. But Zeus's powers was limited by the three fates. Then we have Neptune. He was the Roman god of the sea. He controlled all waters, lived in a golden palace beneath the Mediterranean. He ruled with a trident and was the cause of storms and sinking of ships. His brothers were Pluto and Jupiter. So you can see Peter's intensity of making sure all these myths are circulating around. He wants to be sure to tell folks we're not embellishing a story. We're not making up a myth. We are eyewitnesses to his majesty. And it wasn't only Peter. We see John saying the same thing. In, in 1 John chapter 1, verses 1 through 4, John says, that which was from the beginning, which we have heard, which we have seen with our eyes. We are, we're eyewitnesses. Which we have looked upon and our hands have handled concerning the word of life. The life was manifested and we have seen and bear witness and declare to you that eternal life which was with the Father and was manifested to us, that which we have seen. He said I, things we have seen here three times. That which we have seen and heard we declare to you that you also may have fellowship with us and truly our fellowship is with the Father and with his Son, Jesus Christ. And these things we write to you, that your joy may be full. It's very important for the apostles to make sure, as the word was spread, that people knew. This way, they weren't spreading myths, but they, they were eyewitnesses of the truth. And again, we see the apostle Paul in 1 uh, Corinthians. He says, For I delivered to you, first of all, that which I also received, that Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures, and that he was buried, and he rose again the third day according to the Scriptures, and that he was seen by Cephas, and Cephas is Peter, then by the twelve, 
Verse 6, after that he was seen by over 500 brethren at once. We have 500 eyewitnesses besides the apostles. And he says, of whom the greater part remain to the present. Some have fallen asleep. If you want to check them out, go talk to them. They're also eyewitnesses. And then Paul goes on and says, after that he was seen by James, then by all the apostles, then last of all, he was seen by me as one born out of due time. So Peter describes his eyewitness of Jesus' glory and God the Father's testimony at the transfiguration. So back to Peter. Second Peter, verse 16. I'm going to go here. For, for we did not follow cunningly devised fables when we made known to you the power and coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, but were eyewitnesses of his majesty. Verse 17. For he, Jesus, received from God the Father, honor and glory when such a voice came to him from the excellent glory. This is my beloved Son in whom I am well pleased. And we heard this voice which came from heaven when we were with him on the holy mountain. This is, what, this is known as the transfiguration account. Jesus took uh, Peter, James, and John up to, the, up to a mountain. This was before not very long before he went to Jerusalem the final time. It says, Now after six days, Jesus took Peter, James, and John, his brother, led them up on a high mountain by themselves, and he was transfigured. And that Greek word is metamorphosis. That's where we, where we get that word, which means he was completely changed. His face shone like the sun, and his clothes became white as the light. And behold, Moses and Elijah appeared to them, talking with them. And I'll just interject here. You know, I, I find it interesting when he says, And behold, Moses and Elijah appeared to them. I'm sure Moses and Elijah didn't have name tags on. You know, hi, I'm Moses. You know. That tells me, and this is, I'm just speculating, that when we get to heaven, and we, we're going to know people within I don't know how, but they're glorified bodies. We're going to know them instantly, who they are. So I'm looking forward to that. I'm going to talk to a few of them, see what's going on. Anyway, and behold, Moses and Elijah appeared to them, talking with him. Then Peter answered and said to Jesus, Lord, it is good for us to be here. If you wish, let us make, let us make here three tabernacles, one for you, one for Moses, and one for Elijah. While he was still speaking, behold, a bright cloud overshadowed them. And suddenly a voice came out of the cloud saying, This is my beloved Son in whom I am well pleased. Hear him. And when the disciples heard it, they fell on their face and were greatly afraid. But Jesus came and touched them and said, Arise and do not be afraid. So what we see here in this account, first of all, we see Moses. Moses represents the law. We see Elijah, who represents the prophets. And we know we have Jesus, who did what? He fulfilled the law, and he fulfilled all the prophecies of the promised Messiah. And we have God the Father testifying, this is my son, hear him. Verse 19, Peter goes on and said, because of all this, we have the prophetic word confirmed which you do well to heed as a light that shines in a dark place until the day dawns and the morning star rises in your heart. A better translation of the Greek there where it says the prophetic word confirmed would be we have the prophetic word made more sure. And he says heed, pay attention to the word. What did God say when he said this is my beloved son? whom I am well pleased, hear him. So Peter's saying, heed, pay attention to the word. Jesus is the word, right? This is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. Hear him. Scripture is Jesus shining the light of truth in a very dark and fallen world. 
And we see that stated clearly in John 1, 1 through 5. In the beginning was the Word. The Word was with God. And the Word was God. And who's the Word? Jesus. He, Jesus, was in the beginning with God. All things were made through Jesus. And without Jesus, nothing was made that was made. In Jesus was life, and the life was the light of men. And the light shines in the darkness, and the darkness did not comprehend it. Exactly what Peter says. You do well to heed as a light that shines in a dark place. We have the prophetic word. You do well to heed it. And it says, until the day dawns and the morning star rises in your hearts. What's the morning star? Revelation 22:16 I Jesus have sent my angel to testify to you these things in the churches I Jesus am the root and the offspring of David the bright and morning star So until Jesus returns we have the truth of his word to encourage us guide us give us light in this dark world Sola scriptura scripture alone is our authority as Christians. All, and then in verse 16 of 2 Timothy, all scripture is given, Old Testament and New Testament, all scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness. Jesus tells us, he told us, that the Holy Spirit will guide the writers of the New Testament to proclaim everything that Jesus wants us to know. He did that in John chapter 16, starting in verse 12. He says, I, Jesus, still have many things to say to you, but you cannot bear them now. However, when he, the spirit of truth, has come, he will guide you into all truth, for he will not speak of his own, on his own authority, but whatever he hears, he will speak. And he will tell you things to come. He will glorify me, for he will take of what is mine and declare it to you. All things that the Father has are mine. Therefore I said that he will take of mine and declare it to you. So Jesus is telling us that the Holy Spirit is going to guide these apostles after he's gone. Give them the truth. Reveal to them things that they didn't know. Bring back to remembrance all the things that Jesus said and did. Then Peter goes on in chapter 2, verse 1. He says, Knowing this first, that no prophecy of Scripture is of any private interpretation. For prophecy never came by the will of man, but holy men of God spoke as they were moved by the Holy Spirit. What is the one criticism you hear over and over concerning the Bible? Men wrote the Bible. We can't believe it. We can't take it seriously. It's just men writing, down, writing it down. Peter is again emphasizing when he says, Know this first, that no prophecy of Scripture is of any private interpretation. Prophecy, God's word, never came by the will of man, but holy men of God spoke as they were moved by the Holy Spirit. Once again, Peter's emphasizing we didn't create a fable. We didn't write scripture out of our own thoughts. The Holy Spirit directed the writing of scripture, both Old and New Testaments. The Book of Mormon is written by one man, Joseph Smith. The Quran, written by one man, Muhammad, all the cults that come along were created in their writings by one person. The Bible, God's Word, 66 books written by 40 different writers, kings, fishermen, tax collector, a former Pharisee, a physician, over a period, these 40 different writers, over a period of 1,500 years, 
using three different languages, Hebrew, Aramaic, Aramaic, Greek. They weren't writing 66 stories, but without getting together and coordinating their, their writings, they wrote one story with one great theme, Jesus. Augustine, who was one of the giants of the early church, a defender of the faith, he said this, he said, the New Testament is in the Old Testament concealed. The New Testament is in the Old Testament concealed. If you look in the Old Testament, you're going to find Jesus everywhere. The old, he goes on and he says, the Old Testament is in the New Testament revealed. And we see in the, in the New Testament the prophecies of the Old Testament revealed to be true. So it's, you know, sometimes Christians want to just focus on the New Testament. It's all God's Word. It's Old Testament and New Testament. We need, we need them both. And Paul says in 1 Corinthians 2.13, again emphasizing that these, you know, these aren't written by just men. He says, These things we also speak, not in words which man's wisdom teaches, but which the Holy Spirit teaches, comparing spiritual things with spiritual. Second Peter, chapter 2, verse 1. Peter says, there were, all, there were also false teachers among the people, even as there will be false teachers among you, who will secretly bring in destructive heresies, even denying the Lord who brought them and bring on themselves swift destruction. So he's saying here, you know, there were false teachers all through the old, there were false prophets and teachers all through the Old Testament. Then there's going to be false teachers in the New Testament, and there's going to be false teachers around today. And Peter's concerned about false teachers who will attempt to turn people away from the truth of God to other things, to other fables. And he's writing, like I said, he's not only concerned about the early church, but he's all, this applies equally as well today. And he says, there will be false teachers among you. So today we have false teachers in the visible church. There's a visible church and there's the invisible church. The visible church is what we see every Sunday in the pews, what we see on TV. That's the, that's the visible church. The invisible church are those who have belonged to Christ, those who have given their, their uh, accepted Christ as their Lord and Savior. And we don't know who those are. Only, only God knows that. But he says, uh, and, and, you know, and as Christians, we are, uh, we're stewards. We're stewards of the gospel and we're stewards of, of God's word. So we want to make sure that it's communicated accurately. Now, these false teachers can be very, very charismatic. They can speak with authority, man. I, you know, this is the way it is. And they speak with certainty. False prophets in the Old Testament for Israel. Let's look at Jeremiah chapter 14, 14. And the Lord said to me, to Jeremiah, the prophets prophecy, prophesy, prophesy, <coughs> in, prophecy lies in my name. I'm sorry. The prophets prophesy lies in my name. I have not sent them, commanded them, nor spoken to them. They prophesy to you as a false vision, divination, a worthless thing, and the deceit of their heart. Later on in Jeremiah chapter 23, God says, I have not sent these prophets, yet they ran. I have not spoken to them, yet they prophesied. But if they had stood in my counsel and had caused my people to hear my words then they would have turned from their evil way and from the evil of their doings. And he says, in Ezekiel, back in Ezekiel tells us, her prophets, Israel's prophets, plastered them with untempered mortar, seeing false visions and divining lies for them, saying, thus says the Lord, when the Lord had not spoken. 
So false teachers, false prophets are not anything new. But what is a heresy? Because Peter tells us these false teachers among you will bring in destructive heresies. Well, a heresy is a teaching that can start out subtle at first that tells lies about Jesus and his work for us and in us. A heresy is a teaching that questions the truth of God's word. Hath God said that? Which was Satan's big, big deal. Did God really say that? A heresy is the introduction of doctrine supposedly revealed in a dream or in a revelation or experience that changes or contradicts scripture. You know, I, I was watching a pastor on TV who says, you know, God showed me this. God really isn't sovereign. And he goes on to explain with great authority that God is not sovereign. Well, that's a heresy. <laughs> Another heresy is changing God's word to make friends with the world. They say, well, it was a different culture back then, so we, we have to adapt the word. We need to change it to fit our times. And then we can be popular with the people, and we'll bring in a whole bunch of people. A heresy can start with the performance of lying signs and wonders to pull people away from the truth of the gospel. Jesus said in Matthew 7, 15 and 16, Beware of false prophets who come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly they are ravenous wolves. You will know them by their fruits. Do men gather grapes from thorn bushes or figs from thistles? And the answer is obviously no, they don't. 2 Timothy chapter 4, verses 3 and 4. For the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine, but according to their own desires, because they have itching ears, they will heap up for themselves teachers, and they will turn their ears away from the truth and be turned aside to fables. Mark 13, chapter, chapter 13, verse 22 and 23. For false Christ and false prophets will rise and show signs and wonders to deceive, if possible, even the elect. But take heed. See, I have told you all things beforehand. So heresies are things that challenge, that distort God's word, say things false about Jesus. I'm not talking about little things that maybe divide different, you know, different denominations. You know, we baptize uh, babies and we don't and some other things like that. that. That's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about people who, who change the very foundational doctrines of Christianity for their, for their own purposes. It says, many will follow their destructive ways. This is Second Peter 2, verses 2 and 3. Many will follow their destructive ways because of whom the way of truth will be blasphemed. By covetousness, they will exploit you with deceptive words. For a long time, their judgment has been idle and their destruction does not slumber. It says many will follow their destructive ways. This is many people. He's talking about believers. Many of the people who are in our church are going to follow these false teachers and follow their destructive ways. And why is that? The message of the false teachers tickles their ears. They like it. Hath God really said? Tell them things they want to believe, want to hear. False teachers use deceptive words to attract a following. Why? Why do they want this following? Why are they doing this? By covetousness. They covet attention. They covet honor. They cover earthly treasures. They cover covet being in the spotlight, being somebody important. So how can you keep from being deceived? You have to be discerning. 
discerning of what you hear, what you read, what you see. How are you able to be discerning? There's only one way. You have to know God's word. 2 Timothy 2.15 Be diligent to present yourself approved to God, a worker who does not need to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. If you only come to church on Sunday and Christmas or Easter, you're not going to have an understanding, a full understanding of God's word. If you don't study on your own, if you don't go to Bible studies, and you can be swayed, pulled away by deceptive teachings. Psalm 119, 104, and 105. Through your precepts, I get understanding. Therefore, I hate every false way. Your word is a lamp to my feet and a light to my path. 1 John chapter 4, 1. Beloved, do not believe every spirit, but test the spirits, whether they are of God, because many false prophets have gone out into the world. So when you know God's word and you're grounded in God's word, a teaching from a false teacher you know, sticks out like a sore thumb, causes you to pause. What did he say? Wait, that doesn't line up with the whole counsel of God. So if you want to be discerning, know God's word. And it, 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 it's the light of our path. That as far as I'm going to go tonight. I'm sure you're glad to get out a little early because it's so hot. Uh, Pastor Keith will pick it up next week. And he'll go more, into more depth about false teachers and, and false uh, prophets. So let's close in prayer. Father God, we do thank you so much for the truth of your word. Help us through the power of the Holy Spirit, Father, to put it in our hearts so that we can, we'll never be deceived by, by any false teaching. Thank you for, for tonight. Thank you for those who came out. Father, I also want to lift up the mission trip. All those from our church who, who have gone to Kentucky, be with them, keep them safe. Let them be a blessing to all those who are around them and uh, just bless them themselves as, uh, as they carry out uh, your work in that area. So be with everybody tonight and get them home safely. Thank you, God. We love you in Jesus' name, I pray. Amen.